Hi, uh, welcome to my little talk. Um, it's quite a full one, so I'm not going to uh, uh, beat around the bush. I'm going to get right into it. This is really about uh, the brave new uh, crypto world. I want to sort of um, explore a few things, particularly um, how uh, sovereign chains can interact with each other in this uh, new model, uh, particularly with respect to um, the new sorts of functionality that Polkadot provides. Um, I think it's reasonable to uh, uh, characterize um, much of the progression of blockchain from being very currency oriented, um, cryptocurrency, um, over to being more um, political, more sort of general decision making uh, oriented. And um, that's something that I think will continue into the, into the future. And I think it's a, um, a very interesting trend and one that's uh, critical for society at this stage. Um, before I get into sort of the, 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 the main uh, sort of uh, points, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Polkadot because I think it's only by understanding um, what Polkadot, how Polkadot changes things that, that we can really understand how, um, how the ecosystem as a whole is going to change. So Polkadot is a scalable heterogeneous multi-chain. What does that mean? Well, um, it's, it's scalable because we have lots of different, uh, uh, we parallelize a lot of the execution, a lot of the transaction processing um, within Polkadot. And we do so in a way that doesn't really depend uh, on, uh, uh, doesn't really have a sort of upper limit uh, in terms of its um, eventual um, um, uh, uh, degree of, of parallelism. Um, it's, it's a multi-chain and it's heterogeneous um, because each of these um, pockets of transaction processing logic um, don't specify the kind of fundamental kinds of transactions, um, rather they leave it entirely open-ended um, to, um, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, underlying uh, team or developer or project, or whatever. Um, this gives an unprecedented level of um, flexibility, much more so than um, the sort of um, uh, dynamic resource, uh, dynamic metered model that Ethereum gives, although Ethereum, of course, was um, uh, incredibly um, uh, uh, important at the time. Um, this allows um, for not just um, uh, the kind of smart contract model, although it does allow for that but to be used, but also for uh, more fixed function pipelining, fixed function transaction processing to be done that can give much greater performance gains. Now, Polkadot also has an emphasis on governance and upgradability, two critical elements I think, I think you sort of, I hope to convince you of um, uh, by uh, uh, later in this talk. So uh, Polkadot's really the first of its kind. It's a platform for creating trust-free systems, not unlike smart contract platforms, but it really aims to give um, uh, much um, uh, greater uh, technical guarantees, technical uh, facilities in terms of flexibility, performance, and uh, the underlying security. Um, it's, I think, not tremendously um, uh, unreasonable to compare the sort of uh, uh, transactions per second. Bitcoin here with, realistically, it's somewhere between two and four transactions a second. I put five because it, it has managed to get up there. Uh, but realistically, at the base level, without any tricks, no lightning um, uh, network, no ZK snarks or start tricks or, you know, at its basic level of computational performance, um, which can obviously be increased uh, and improved uh, across all chains uh, by using these tricks. Uh, but at the base level performance, we're looking at around five transactions per second for Bitcoin and not very much programmable functionality, about 25 transactions per second for Ethereum, um, but obviously with much more program uh, programmable functionality, although the more you use it, the worse it becomes. Um, Kusama, um, about a thousand on its base chain transactions per second with the programmable functionality, um, being much, much more um, um, uh, well, highly performant. Um, I mean, it's, this is the programmable functionality that we're looking at. This is using a, a WebAssembly base layer, which I'll go into in a second. Polkadot, because it has the parachains, and Kusama will eventually have parachains, but I'm sort of talking about Kusama right now. Polkadot, once it has the parachains, will be scaling up to maybe 100,000, um, up to maybe a, a million uh, transactions per second. And I'll quickly talk about that. Um, how will it do that? 1,000 transactions per second on the parachain, 100 parachains, 100,000 transactions a second. 100 is probably quite conservative. We've done some design upgrades. Probably Probably it's going to be, I think, it might get up to maybe even 200 uh, parachains. Um, and there's all sorts of further optimizations that we can do in terms of the database and I.O. Um, uh, storage layer, uh, the WebAssembly interpreter layer. This is all 
fundamentally um, um, on a, a meta protocol platform, which means it's upgradable. Um, and also multi-threading, we do aim to, to bring in multi-threading to this, which will allow um, much better use of these sort of six, eight core um, 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 CPUs that we're seeing um, um, uh, increasingly um, prevalent. Polkadot is, is fundamentally upgradable, it's governable, unlike basically yeah, most of the chains. Um, there are one or two that could maybe make this claim as well, but uh, um, Polkadot does it in uh, 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 a little more style, I think. Um, it's a WebAssembly-based meta protocol. This means that the logic of Polkadot is um, placed actually on the chain, on Polkadot. Polkadot hosts its own logic. It's a bit of a crazy idea, but there it is. And it's able to do this by using WebAssembly. WebAssembly effectively um, allows logic, allows the, the algorithm or the protocol to be described as data. Right, as, as instructions. And it's used for both the parachains, these, these shards, these uh, individual parallel transaction processing units, and the relay chain, so the, um, the, the thing that cooperates and coordinates between, that allows these guys to, to, to cooperate and coordinate, and gives them their security. Because we use a meta protocol, we have seamless upgrades that are controlled by the underlying logic of the consensus, the underlying um, logic of the chain. So the chain's logic can dictate what the chain's logic changes to, can dictate its own changes. In essence, it has control over its own destiny. What do we call this? Um, I think agency is a really good word, right? Agency is, um, is how we describe things that have control over their own destiny. Upgradeability and governability um, changes a chain from something that doesn't have agency um, to something that does. So what's a token? Let's, we need to um, sort of really dive into this, I think, in order to really understand how um, tokens are, uh, uh, or token economies, are able to interact with each other at a sovereign level. Um, now tokens uh, I've seen described, or token economies, I should say, it's kind of a, a funny dichotomy here, but token economies are described uh, in one of the three C's, three C's. Commodity, currency, or corporation. Commodity is kind of the dumbest. Uh, I, 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 think, I think these three, the three C's, um, to pin a protocol on there, we have to, it, it, it depends on the protocol itself, the, 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 the fundamental protocol of the token, not any derivative protocols where token derivatives um, uh, might, be live, live, uh, might live or be exchanged. Um, and I think it under, you know, understanding whether a token has agency is the critical um, sort of difference between the three. So at the top level, you've got commodity, dumb chains, right? No agency. Bitcoin um, sort of loudly, uh, or many of its adherents loudly um, uh, um, advertise Bitcoin as basically having no agency, right? It doesn't do anything beyond its stated uh, 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 original goals. Bitcoin is meant to be this kind of digital um, uh, um, um, uh, natural resource, right? Digital gold is, is often how it's been described. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it isn't managed, right? No one is going to take charge of Bitcoin and change its underlying economics. That's kind of its point. Um, currency uh, is, is uh, I think, where, where you've got something that's a bit more managed. It's maybe a little bit more like something that has a central bank behind it, where the central bankers can make decisions on uh, maybe uh, the inflation or, or other very limited characteristics of, its, uh, of the chain, uh, but still um, things uh, that are not fundamentally controlled by its logic. Corporation uh, is the final one, and this is re really where it has full agency to change itself, where it's an amorphous protocol. Um, and this is the sorts of thing that, that sort of great companies have, the ability to reinvent themselves. Um, Microsoft, uh, sort of, uh, at least as, as you know, sort of software developer, um, uh, I've seen Microsoft kind of reinvent itself from the 90s where it's sitting on its cash cow of, uh, of, of Windows and, and Office and it's doing its best to stifle any competition um, into the sort of company that it is now that's much more forward looking, much more um, uh, cooperative and I think it's, it's a really nice transition. Um, Nokia as well, if you, if you sort of look at Nokia's history, it's reinvented itself countless times um, and it's this agency um, that allows it to do that. Um, now, if we look at models of uh, mergers and acquisitions, um, 
uh, and, and how we might apply them to tokenomics, I think we've got kind of two rough models. Um, and, and I wouldn't really call one of them mergers and acquisitions. So the gold standard and even the ETH1 to ETH2 transition, uh, where uh, you know you do have two separate systems. Um, both of the, these two, I think, are derivatives. The USD being a derivative of gold, of course, uh, originally discontinued for, for many decades, but uh, originally. And the ETH1 to ETH2 with ETH2, the ether of ETH2, uh, one-way peg. So it allows ETH1 to be burnt, to populate the ETH2 um, ec uh, econo economy, uh, but still, because it can't go back again, ETH1 doesn't recognize the ETH2 minting process. Really, these are not, these two are not mergers and acquisitions, they're derivatives, right? We want to understand purchases, and I think the Eurozone uh, change did actually allow us to see how that might happen um, uh, in terms of a currency, but only when you really do have a large degree of agency between the constituent powerful uh, controlling elements of these currencies. It needs a currency, it can't happen with a commodity. Um, why? Because there needs to be agency. It, we need a way of allowing an economy to act um, on its own behalf, act as a whole. Um, on behalf of its, of its uh, various stakeholders, whatever. Um, and if you don't have agency, then there's no way you can do this. In the same way that ETH1 doesn't have agency over itself, right? So there's no way how ETH1 could agree to some of the network's um, uh, 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 minting process, even if it's ETH2. Um, how, do we com how do we complete a merger? Well, it, it's... it's uh, it, it's it's difficult. Uh, the, initially, you've got to sort of uh, agree to the terms of the merger, and this must obviously because chains are machine executed, they have to be machine readable terms, um, uh, indeed machine executable terms. Um, now, generally, this is probably going to be um, fixing a price. Beyond that is where it gets really technically difficult. Chains have to respect each other's tokens. So basically, if a chain wants two chains of uh, sovereign chains have agreed on their price, then these sovereign chains have to make themselves, in some sense, subservient to each other. They have to respect each other's token base, and more importantly, they have to inspect, uh, respect the logic that creates those tokens. If one chain has a bug in its token creation logic and somehow allows a validator um, to mint you know, tons and tons of tokens because of some overflow or some other thing, um, then it has to respect that. Like Fundamentally, it can't just sort of say, oh, you know, I'm ignoring you now um, on its own terms. Big problem. Um, in some sense, there has to be some shared um, idea of, of, of sovereignty that they, that they both respect. And finally, if they want to share their token, which I think they will do eventually, they, they will need to because um, having two separate tokens that just happens to have a fixed price doesn't really constitute a merger, right? Company merges, it doesn't just allow a share, shares to be, um, uh, uh, to be uh, uh, bought and sold at a particular fixed price. No, the company merges because it wants to make a single company with the best elements of both. Um, and that again requires some fundamental underlying shared security layer, a shared layer of, 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 uh, of, of consensus that allow them to have a shared destiny. Polkadot facilitates this by being an underlying platform for blockchains that allow them to get um, their own uh, shared security, their own um, underlying consensus without restricting in any way what they can do um, in their own um, deterministic uh, logical uh, execution. And this uh, is what gives Polkadot its underlying value as a system. It allows sovereign chains to interact without prejudice in a trust-free fashion. That's how I see mergers and acquisitions. That's how I see Polkadot helping uh, in this regard. I hope the talk has been uh, enlightening or at least given you something to think about. Um, and, uh, and I hope we all see um, some of this uh, uh, really interesting stuff um, happening in the very near future. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.